Welcome once again, everybody, to uh, the online service of Good Community Church and the Canvas Ministry. You know, as this coronavirus crisis was first starting to get really serious here in the United States, a friend of mine uh, posted something on Facebook that I thought was pretty in insightful. He said that God is definitely removing idols from our culture, money, athletes, teams, politicians, self-reliance, etc. Now, uh, he's not a prophet, <laughs> and I'm not a prophet either. I can't uh, presume to say that I know what God is doing through this coronavirus crisis, but it doesn't take a prophet to realize that all of these idols and many more idols in our lives are like snowflakes in the hands of God, in the hands of our sovereign God. These snowflakes melt in his heat. But we should not look to the circumstances uh, of this world alone to understand what God is doing in our lives and in this world. We first have to look at the Word of God. Now today, I'm backtracking a little bit in, in living life. Uh, right now, living life is in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and we will get there uh, next week. But I, want, I wanted to cover at least uh, one message from the prophet Haggai. Uh, partly because it is such a short book that if, if we blink, we could easily miss it. Uh, of course, the, the shortness of this book does not uh, make it any less significant, uh, any less uh, powerful either. Uh, so uh, the main reason, though, that I wanted to cover Haggai is because I couldn't help thinking, as I was reading through this book during my uh, QT last week, I couldn't help thinking that God had intentionally given us this message from the prophet Haggai for such a time as this. And what is the message of Haggai for such a time as this? It is, be strong because God is God. And that's what I'm going to be sharing uh, with us uh, today. Our passage, it gives us three reasons for being strong. And the first one is this, be strong because of God's glory. Be strong because of God's glory. So when God asks the people in verse 3, he says, Who of you is left who saw this house, meaning the temple, in its, first, in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Now, there would have been very few people who would have been alive uh, before the first temple was destroyed 66 years earlier. But the point that God is making is not to compare uh, the first temple with the second temple. The point that God is making is that God demands that his presence in this world be glorious. That's God's point. And of course, uh, the temple of God doesn't represent the presence of God so much as the people of God does. God has always wanted to be glorified in and through his people. And I'm not talking, uh, ho-hum, God wants to be glorified in and through his people, whatever. No, God wants to be glorified in and through his people. That has always been the case from the very beginning. And that has been God's will from the very beginning. But when it comes to glorifying God, the people of God has all, have always faced two obstacles, two challenges. Uh, the first is external. It's external opposition. And the second is internal. Internal spiritual atrophy. Now, by atrophy, what atrophy is, is uh, that's what happens to muscles when you don't use them. When you don't exercise your muscles, they atrophy or they weaken especially when you break a bone or, or sprain a bone. Uh, and this is exactly what happens to us spiritually as well. If we are not exercising our faith, we become spiritually weak. Uh, we suffer from spiritual atrophy. And that's what I'm talking about here. And so this is what was happening to the remnant of Judah. This is what they were facing. External opposition and spiritual atrophy. How did they get to this point? So the kingdom of Babylon, uh, in biblical history, the kingdom of Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem and had destroyed the temple 
back in 586 B.C., and they sent most of the Jews into exile uh, into Babylon at that time. Now, about 50 years later, around 539 B.C., uh, the Persians under King Cyrus, they, uh, they defeated the Babylonians. And at that time, one year later, uh, King Cyrus, uh, he declared an edict allowing all the exiles to return to their homeland, and not just return to their homeland, he allowed them to, uh, to rebuild their houses of worship. So when Zerubbabel, the governor uh, of the Jews, and Joshua, the high priest, and all the people of Judah, uh, they returned to Jerusalem, they laid down the foundation uh, for the temple. But then the Jews started to face some uh, pretty heavy political opposition from the people who were already uh, living there. And we read about this in the book of Ezra. But external opposition, like I said, isn't the only problem. Spiritual atrophy was starting to set in. And the Jewish remnant, they put off uh, building the temple for another 18 years. It wasn't just because of the uh, political opposition. So finally, finally God, uh, he sends a message to the Jewish people in Jerusalem uh, through the prophet Haggai, uh, which is what the first chapter uh, is about. And God tells the people in chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? And he's talking about the temple, of course. In other words, they put off building the house of God and devoted their lives to pursuing their own well-being and their own prosperity. And then in verses 8 through 11 in the first chapter, God, uh, the Haggai says that God brought a drought upon the land to get the attention of the people of Judah. Now, to their credit, the leaders and the people of Judah, they repented. And at the end of chapter 1, it tells us that they started the work of rebuilding the temple. But then almost one month later, which is where chapter, chapter 2 starts, apparently, uh, apparently uh, their efforts were uh, far, far from glorious. They did not put forth their best, best effort. And so God, he gently but firmly reprimands the people of Judah. And this is because why? Because God demands that his presence in this world be glorious, especially in and through his people. And this is exactly why Jesus said in, in Matthew, on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 6, he said, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, all these things are all the things that everybody chases after thinking, if I only had all those things, my life would be fulfilled, my life would be complete, and I would be happy. In other words, all these things are all the idols that people ch chase after. But all these idols we know are a very poor substitute and a terrible substitute for the presence of God in our lives. And one commentary, uh, it put it this way. And this is a bit of a longer quote, but it's, it's worth hearing. It says, in reality, they, meaning the, the Judahites, the people in Judah, sought first the kingdom of self and its comforts. They would get around to the work of God after those priorities had first been settled. But there was, for them, an unexpected irony. Due to the with withdrawal of God's blessings upon their efforts, they painfully discovered that none of life's necessities was added to them to the degree that they would like, in spite of their determined efforts to the contrary. Their work was reduced to nothing. Their crops failed because of disease and disaster. Their harvests yielded only meager results. Whatever financial profits they gained quickly disappeared, passing, as it were, through a shabby bag riddled with holes and unable to retain what was deposited in it. In spite of their determined efforts, the prosperity that they craved eluded them. The opportunity afforded by Cyrus became a casualty of lesser pursuits on the part of the Jewish population. Now, brothers and sisters, we live in an incredibly wealthy country, and we have some incredible freedoms at our disposal. We have the freedom to seek first 
God's kingdom and his righteousness freely. Not everybody has that freedom, but has this opportunity that God has afforded to us become a casualty of lesser pursuits for us. And so maybe, I'm thinking just maybe, God has given us the coronavirus pandemic to remind us of this very thing, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to us too. But like I said, I am not a prophet, but I know that Haggai is. And I am much more certain of the fact that God has given us his word through Haggai and the whole council of scripture, uh, not the least of which is the words of Jesus Christ himself, to continually remind us of this truth, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Because we continually need to be reminded of this truth. And so there's one question that the prophecy of Haggai raises for the Jewish remnant, and it raises for us as well. And it's this. Do we, as the people of God, have a hunger? Do we have a passion? Do we have a desire? Do we have a zeal to see God glorified in and through us? Now, brothers and sisters, I know, I know that I am not preaching to hearts of stone here. And I know that many of us have been thinking these very things too. And I've been really blessed to see the response of this entire community through this crisis. And my hope and prayer is that our passion and zeal to see God glorified in and through us would continue, would continue even after this crisis is over, God willing, until our Lord returns. Let our response not just be about this crisis, but let our response be because that is the will of God. It has always been God's will, and it always will be God's will. Let's be strong because of God's glory. The second thing that this passage shows us is that we should be strong because of God's covenant. So like I said, God reprimanded the people for their half-hearted effort, and it was a gentle reprimand. And this was mainly due to their spiritual atrophy, their half-hearted effort. They had become spiritually weak and feeble. And it was also because of their spiritual weakness that they caved in easily to the external opposition. They got discouraged because of the external opposition that was around them at that time. And we, we read about all this, in, uh, especially in Ezra chapters 5 and 6. God knew that the people wanted to obey him, but they had not been exercising their spiritual muscles. And so that they have become spiritually weak and spiritually feeble for a long time. So more than anything, God, he just wanted to encourage the remnant of Judah to press on, to press on. So God tells Zerubbabel, the governor, and he tells uh, Joshua, the high priest, and he tells all the people of the land of Judah to be strong and to do the work of rebuilding the temple. And then God tells them why they can be strong and do the work of rebuilding the temple. He says, for I am with you. I am with you. And this is what I covenanted, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now this is very similar to what King David had said to his son Solomon. Right before King David died, he had uh, drawn up all the plans for the temple, but he was not allowed to build it. So he gave all the plans and all the resources to his son Solomon. And then he said to Solomon in First Chronic Chronicles 28, uh, chapter 28, verse 20, he said, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now when God says, for I am with you, he is reminding them of his covenant relationship 
with them, which can never, ever be undone. And he is telling the remnant of Judah that he has saved them to be his chosen people, his special possession, specifically so that they might serve him and worship him. In other words, he is saying, I saved you, now you serve me. And if God has preserved them for this very purpose, then God for sure will absolutely make sure that they finish construction of the temple. And so they do not need to fear because his spirit will be with them. And for such a time as this today, God is telling us to be strong and do the work of building up his church. And why is that? Because I say so? God forbid. God forbid. It's because through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are his church. We are his people. And he is our God. Through Christ, God has established a new covenant with us that is better, way better, far superior than the old one. And the author of Hebrews, he put it this way. He said, In chapter 8, verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. And while this covenant through faith in Jesus Christ is far superior to the old one, the reason for calling us into a covenant relationship with him has never changed. The Apostle Peter, he wrote this in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And let's not forget Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And let's not forget uh, Ephesians 4, uh, verse 16. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This has never changed. Which is to say, if we are the people of God, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, these things have never changed for us. These spiritual truths apply to us, so we should apply our lives to these spiritual truths. So brothers and sisters, let's be strong and let's do the work of building up the church because we are the body of Christ after all. And so let's have no fear whatever may be in our hearts, whatever our circumstances may be, because the spirit of the living God is living inside of us through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has called us into a covenant relationship with him for this very purpose. So let's be strong because of God's covenant. The final reason for being strong is this. Be strong because of God's son. Now, like pretty much like all of Old Testament prophecy, verses 6 through 9 are a prophecy that predicts two different things in the future at the same time. On the one hand, God is telling the remnant of Judah that he will cause the nations to provide funding for the rebuilding of the temple. And that's exactly what happened. In the book of Ezra, the governor of the region uh, wrote to King Darius asking uh, King Darius about the authority that the Jews had to rebuild the temple. And then so King Darius, he writes back and he wrote this. Uh, this is found in Ezra chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. He said, the costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Also the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and, bought and brought to Babylon, are to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. So not only did Darius give them authorization to rebuild the temple, he gave them authorization to use the treasuries of Persia to rebuild 
uh, the temple and also to restore all the gold and silver and all the other things, all the other artifacts that had been taken under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and to restore them to the house of God as well. And so God provided in every way to rebuild the temple. But even so, that second temple, when it first started out, was very humble, at least compared to the first temple. And even though this temple that they rebuilt had humble beginnings, eventually Herod the Great would start a renovation project that lasted for 40 years. It took 40 years to finish that re renovation project. And so the glory of the second temple actually surpassed the glory of the first temple by far. But even so, just as the first temple had been destroyed, the second temple would be destroyed in 70 AD, 70 AD by the Romans too. So this prophecy that Haggai is giving us is not just talking about the glory of the second temple. He's talking about something that is permanent, not something that is temporary. So these verses are also a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's how the author of Hebrews understood this passage, this prophecy of Haggai. He wrote in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 through 29. He said, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So what we see here is that not only does the author of Hebrews see this prophecy as the coming of Jesus Christ, he sees this prophecy as the coming of Jesus Christ and his church. And he is saying that the Jewish temple, which is temporary, will be replaced by something which is permanent. That is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the church itself is not just another building. The church is not a building. The church is the true people of God. And the true people of God can never be shaken and can never be destroyed. That is how the author of Hebrews understands it. And that is how we should understand it as well. And the glory of this house, this house, which is the church of Jesus Christ, will far surpass the glory of the former house, which is the temple. Because through his spirit, the son of God, Jesus Christ, he dwells in our hearts through faith. And we dwell in him through faith. And when he returns, and he most certainly will return one day, he will grant true peace to this house. He will grant peace to his people, the church. Brothers and sisters, we can be strong and there is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear even in times like this because through faith in the Son of God, we are the church. We are the immortal church. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How else are we to understand this, these verses except to understand it as talking about the eternal church? We are immortal brothers and sisters and we can be strong and there is nothing to fear even in times like these because God has chosen us to be in a covenant relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. And that covenant fellowship will never, ever be broken, will never, ever be destroyed, will never, ever be shaken. He is our God, and he will always be our God. We are his people, and we will always be his people through faith. And we can be strong, and there is nothing to fear, even in times like these, because God is God. And God will never be denied his glory. And so praise be to God that we are his people, that he is our God, that we are his church, that he is our God. And praise be to God through faith in his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Let's be strong, brothers and sisters. Let's build up his church and give, give God the glory that he is due. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.